Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. This week, it's our honor to host Representative Rob Whitman of Virginia's 1st Congressional District. He chairs the House Armed Services Subcommittee on Tactical Air and Land Forces. Plus, he also holds a seat on the Sea Power and Projection Forces Subcommittee. From an Air Force perspective, it doesn't get any more dialed in than this. These two committees collectively cover Air Force fighters, bombers, UAVs, airlifters, cargo aircraft, munitions, and much of the R&D portfolio. Joining me today for this episode is Mitchell Institute Dean, Lieutenant General David Deptula. Sir, as always, great to have you with us. Yeah, great to be here. And we are honored to have Congressman Whitman. Sir, really appreciate your time. I know you are a busy man, so thanks for chatting with us on the Aerospace Advantage. Thanks so much. Great to be with you. Congressman uh, Whitman, if you don't mind, let's start this off by setting the stage at a strategic level. When you engage with your constituents, how do you describe the security picture around the globe? And a related aspect, how do you articulate the need that due to that security condition, how we should invest in our military? That's a great question. People are concerned today about what they see happening around the globe. They do sense that it's very different than where we were 20 some odd years ago with the counterinsurgency and counterterrorism fight. I think people understand today what happened with the unprovoked attack of Russia on Ukraine. They also understand the aggressive behavior by China and understand that we are in a very different world today, one that is of threat to us not just strategically, but economically, and for that matter, the very social fabric of our nation. So I think folks are very much attuned to the challenges that we face. And I think also within that realm, too, they understand how incredibly important it is to have the proper military structure to be able to counter those threats that we see around the world. I talked to a number of folks, and they are very concerned about the United States perceived lack of ability to properly counter these threats around the world. They also, too, want to make sure that we have, in areas like Ukraine, in our efforts to help, make sure that there is a focus and that the United States is not the sole contributor in helping Ukraine in that situation. That's very good. Thanks very much, Mr. Congressman Uh, Slick. Over to you. Thank you, sir. And Congressman, you began serving in Congress in 2007. And looking back, the threat environment, it looked a lot different back then. And those circumstances certainly posed a different set of challenges. Now, as a member of Congress, what was it like to watch the rise of China? And when did you first get a sense that peer competition should concern us? Well, as we watched the shift from the counterterrorism, counterinsurgency fight, which is where we were when I first arrived in Congress to where we are today. Uh, the shift is, at least in my mind, has been very apparent. In fact, if specifically in thought process, in, in about 2010, I saw just efforts by China that concerned me. And then also you saw some efforts by the Obama administration as well as Congress in talking about the pivot to the indo paycom or the pivot to Asia, as it was called. The challenge with that was it was words only. As I traveled to the Indo-Pacific and spoke with nations there who had heard that the United States was going to pivot to the Indo-Pacific, uh, what they saw versus the words they heard were very different. And they were frustrated in the fact that They didn't see a whole lot of action by the United States, and I completely understand that. And what we see today is a, I think, lack of resolve in really building the necessary capability in the Indo-Pacific, naively believing that somehow China was not going to act 
aggressively in that area of the world. And what we've seen is they've actually not only acted aggressively in the Indo-Pacific, but they've done so around the world. They have gone in and developed operations in places like Africa and now South America to exploit natural resources there. We've seen them, too, go into other countries and try to put in place not only economic agreements, but in some instances, strategic agreements, especially with Pacific Island nations, places where the United States before has been relatively strong, but has not followed up on the efforts necessary in those regions. So we see China really pursuing a world-based strategy in every turn, trying to undercut the United States strategically and economically. So the world we live in today is very different, but we shouldn't be surprised. Xi Jinping has done everything that he said he was going to do. When he came into office 11 years ago, he laid out a strategy for what China was going to do, and we should not be surprised. And we should not undersell what China's doing. To hear Secretary Yellen the other day say at a hearing that we don't see China as an adversary. We see them as a strategic competitor. Trying to downplay all the aggressive behavior by China, I think is not only irresponsible, but it's whistling past the graveyard. Well, I miss you, Congressman. If I could be so bold as to say, you're just spot on. Hearing what you just repeated coming out of Yellen, it just, it is really sad that people actually think that way. And quite frankly, it's old thing. It's being stuck in the past and wishing something that in fact is not the case. Now, in 2018, in response to direction from Congress, the Air Force acknowledged that it was too small to meet the demands of the national defense strategy. And as a result, they outlined the need for growth in nearly every mission area. Uh, But here we are five years later, and the service is actually smaller and older. Actually, it's the smallest and the oldest it's ever been in its entire history. Uh, At the same time, these challenges that you just described around the globe continue to grow. As a member of Congress, are, are you concerned with this disconnect, and how do you think we ought to deal with it? Well, I'm very concerned. I think this is an all-hands-on-deck moment for the nation. This is the challenge of our lifetime, and we have to be able to change things in months, not in years. We've had a Pentagon and, for that matter, service branches that are walking, walking towards this effort to modernize, and they should be sprinting to modernize based on the pace of the threat. We call China a pacing threat. If China is running, shouldn't we be running? We shouldn't be walking. There's a divergence there. This, though, isn't unique to the Air Force. We see with other service branches like the Navy, this whole idea that they are going to divest to invest. And we've seen through history that never happens. The divestiture dollars that are saved never result in capacity to replace the retired capacity in any period of time that's relevant. And the same thing's happening today. They want to retire these old platforms. And listen, some of them do need to be retired. No two ways about it. The A-10, the F-15 Cs and Ds, they they struggle to be able to operate in any meaningful way in the environments that we have today. You could argue about the A-10 in certain circumstances, and they're not going to retire all of them at one time. But The idea that somehow the savings from retiring those aircraft are immediately going to result in a follow-on capacity is just not anything that's going to happen. You don't see those dollars directly translating. So you see this divestiture curve. So you see the number of platforms continue to go down. So let's look at the downward side of that curve. And then you look at it and say, where is an upward side of the curve going to occur with new capability, with new capacity, with new aircraft? And which is the separation in years between the downward curve from aircraft retiring and the upward curve of aircraft coming in the inventory is separated by years. In fact, most of it is outside the future year's defense plan, better known as the fight up. So that's at least five years. So if you're going to start building new aircraft beginning at five years, they're not going to be it available for operations until years after that. So this mindset of divesting to invest is a failed strategy. And it really is provocational. I think to China, as they look at it and go, we really don't have to worry about things. They're doing it on their own. They're divesting capacity and capability on their own, which is very frustrating. We have to be able to move 
at the speed of relevance, which means we have to be able to do these things in months, not years. We have to look creatively and innovatively to be able to bring that capacity on. Listen, I'm glad they're pursuing the next generation air defense system. The CCA is the unmanned component of that I think is going to be incredibly important. What are we doing now to replace the platforms in a timely way? And, and even if it means uh, looking at other ways to deliver the same sorts of weapons is going to be key. And another element, too, is we're getting outsticked by our opponents. And that means that their aircraft can shoot at us from distances longer than we can shoot at them. So we fall within the range of their weapon systems before we can deploy our weapons that would hold them at risk. That's a bad scenario. And it, when we do have those long range weapons, we don't have enough of them in our inventory. So our magazine depth is very shallow and there's nothing worse than being a fighter pilot going into a fight and then going, as the term goes, Winchester. And then you're having to get out with no weapons. Those are the scenarios that we see ourselves in, and that is a horrible place to be. Well, sir, I want to hop in really quick and say, knowing your background and what you've done before, you speak just like a fighter pilot. So I really do appreciate the terminology, and you obviously get the challenges that airmen are facing. And I want to pull on this thread just a little bit more, and I really appreciate you breaking down this divest to invest mindset. Just to put some numbers to it, and you really talked what we talked about years ago about this fighter bathtub, right, where we're declining. If you look at it on a chart, it's this big U-shaped arc, and it's a big bathtub of fighters. So we're looking to retire 1,468 aircraft and only buy 467. So it's a net reduction of over 1,000 aircraft. And just to ask you a pointed question, sir, what is your advice to Air Force leadership as they keep finding themselves in this position? It's like, that's a great point. I can say this, that I'm not a mathematician, but I fail to see how you can do addition by subtraction. And I fail to see how retiring large numbers of aircraft and then waiting uh, outside the fight up to replace them is in any way, shape or form a strategy going forward. Listen, I understand and I support the retirement of A-10s, as I said, in the 15 C's and D's. But here's where we are. We have an we have an F-15 EX program. That's a program of record that's not fully funded. Those aircraft, I think, do have a role there. As we talked about in NGAD, the challenge there is we're talking about aircraft that are going to be incredibly capable, but are be costing hundreds of millions of dollars per platform. So you're not going to build a fleet like we are with F-35s. And another thing, too, is with F-35As, now we're face, faced with an engine upgrade because the engines are being run harder, which means more heat. More heat means fewer serviceable hours in the engine. And now we have another bill to pay in modernizing the engines there. F-22s, we have the Block 20s that they want to retire. The F-22 is the most capable air-to-air -air aircraft in the world. And why we wouldn't look at saying, is there something we can do with the Block 20s, which are training aircraft and make them combat capable is beyond me. We've actually asked uh, the Congressional Budget Office to, to take a look at that and let us know what we can do to maybe put a few dollars in there to keep those aircraft in the inventory. It doesn't make sense to me to retire F-22s. The F-16, the Air Force in this budget canceled the electronic warfare upgrade for the existing F-16s. So it puts in the question the viability and survivability of the aircraft in that fleet of the future. We're going to need those aircraft in those mission roles, yet we're looking at taking away capability. I talked earlier, too, about the unmanned component of the next generation air defense system, and that is the collaborative combat aircraft, better known as the unmanned systems there. Listen, there's a lot of capability there, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We have existing platforms out there. You look at what Australia is doing with loyal wingmen, incredibly capable aircraft. You look at what's happening here in the United States with Valkyrie, an incredibly capable aircraft that the Air Force has already talked about and looked at using as an unmanned component of the fleet. We're going to have to look at unmanned as weapons platforms, as sensor platforms going forward to make sure we have what we need to bridge the gap as we modernize and we're going to have to look at a variety of different ways to do things. And we also need to look at the weapons that those aircraft are going to carry. We have to be mindful, too, that our magazine depth in the Indo-PACOM is precariously low. And especially with long-range weapons, we better look at ways to make sure that we make 
China have to fire their weapons at platforms that aren't the aren't the really high price platforms. I I would love to see a scenario where we can force China to be firing their million dollar plus missiles at fifty thousand dollar platforms. That's the way that we are able to equalize and close the gap on magazine depth. Otherwise, we're going to be in a really bad spot. It's great to hear you say that. I just make a comment on the F-22s. Even the Block 20 F-22s, the training coded F-22s, can perform, outperform any fourth generation aircraft in the world. So the notion of retiring 32 or 33 of the world's greatest and the most capable aircraft to save money simply reflects the death spiral that the Air Force is in, and it needs the funds to be able to do both modernize as well as retain the aircraft that it has. Because as you so well articulated, the Chinese are a current threat. They're not one that's going to show up in 2035 when we get all our ducks in a row. Um, So if I might, while the Air Force is declining in force size, and I'd offer that's in part because it's been funded less than the Army and the Navy for 31 years in a row now, There are also some good things happening in the Air Force right now. And one of the top items on that list is the B-21. As we all know, that program's been managed in a very unique fashion with the Rapid Capabilities Office leading the effort. Uh, And given the high classification of the effort, congressional oversight must have been pretty unique. Uh, But from your perspective, what clicked on this program? And what do you think are some of the positive lessons that we should employ elsewhere? Sure. I've had the real honor and privilege to watch the B-21 program from its infancy, to go out to Palmdale as things were getting off the ground, to talk to Air Force RCO, uh, to talk to Northrop Grumman. And at the early stages, I was somewhat skeptical because I knew the key with that was to develop a very skilled workforce of engineers to make sure that we got the design right and to make sure before we got into production, that the designs were mature and that the aspects of the design were agreed upon between the customer, that is the Air Force, and Northrop Grumman. So we've seen issues in the past when that hasn't happened. But to Northrop Grumman's positive efforts, they were able to put together a workforce. And to the credit of Air Force RCO and the Air Force, they were shoulder to shoulder with Northrop Grumman day one, every day. It wasn't, let's go back to Washington, we come back and we say, oh, gosh, why are you doing that? It was shoulder to shoulder effort every day. So if there was a hiccup, they sat down, talked about it and said, okay, this is the path forward. And that is, I think, the secret to success for B-21, as well as the suppliers, if you look at companies like Spirit, give Spirit credit, man. They stepped up. There were some issues with the wings to begin with. They stepped up, fixed those issues. The same with Pratt & Whitney. There were some issues early on with Northrop and with Pratt. They worked through those issues, got the engine issues t- taken care of. So it just goes to show that they were able to work through that. And they did that in real time. It wasn't a back and forth. It wasn't send a memo to to, to the Air Force PEO in Washington and have them say, listen, what you're supposed to be doing and going back and forth. These things were taken care of in real time. And I think that it stands as a true example about what you can do in a program like that. Remember, this will be the most advanced aircraft ever constructed by man. And it can do things that no other aircraft on the face of the earth can do. That's cutting edge technology that many times in the military gets hung up time-wise because of non-performance or because there have been hiccups there or sometimes over-promising and under-delivering. None of those things have happened with B-21. It has to be the standard bearer for what's needed going forward uh, in these efforts. And listen, it's a must-have platform. And our nuclear triad, it is the key in that triad. And I have to give the Air Force and Northrop Grumman credit in the things that they've done to get us to where we are today. Yes, sir. I really appreciate the words there because we've obviously seen programs that have not flown, no pun intended, as as smoothly as B-21. And I do want to shift gears and get your view on the F-35, which is another program that's at a critical juncture. Obviously, things like withdrawing F-15s from Kadena in the Pacific without a permanent backfill was a clear warning about how bad things are 
from a fighter capacity vantage, and we're not buying enough new fighters to backfill Cold War era jets that are just simply worn out. And the Air Force has long argued that it will not increase F-35 production until Block 4 jets are in production. Given that the foundations of that capability appear to be crossing the finish line with the TR-3 upgrade currently in flight test, what are the indicators that you're going to be watching to assess whether or not you're comfortable boosting the buy? Listen, I I'm fully support the aspects that you're speaking about with the F-35 program. The, my, my challenge is holding off the Block 4 surge production. Uh, the program's still in the very early stages of providing the, the TR-3 hardware. And the thing that concerns me about that is the TR-3 hardware deliveries we've learned recently is delayed until at least December this year. I believe it's probably going to be closer to Q2 of 24, which pushes all of that production of Block 4 to the right. I'm just disappointed that the F-35 program office has yet to really do the things it needs to do to deliver on schedule. And we've had time and time again where cost and schedules have been, have been unmet. And those things that are concerning to me. I, I think there are a couple of different factors we have to look at in accelerating the F-35 program beyond the current production rate. And remember, we're not even at full rate production yet. And I want to make sure that we are getting there. The program office, I think, needs to bring down the sustainment and maintenance costs for the aircraft. They're going to have to decrease the operating cost of the aircraft by 47% to afford the 1,763 aircraft they plan to buy. And they're going in the wrong direction with that as we look at the F-135 engine now being less capable of maintaining its expected service life of 2,000 operational hours. So now we're looking at engine upgrades that are going to add additional cost to the to the sustainment cost of F-35. Again, if you look up front and trying to reduce the purchase cost, you end up pushing the bulge of cost into another realm, and that is the operation and maintenance cost. Absolutely un unacceptable. And the supply chain and parts repair enterprise for F-35 needs to have, I think, the adequate capacity and sufficient turnaround time to support an increase in the F-35 inventory. We have to be able to use additive manufacturing. We have to do things to be able to bring down the cost of operating those aircraft. We've looked at existing F-35s right now, and the operational availability of those aircraft concerns me because the sustainment enterprise isn't being sufficiently sized and isn't effectively or efficiently functioning to absorb these additional aircraft. Lord forbid when we have even more aircraft in the future. So the sustainment side of the equation is not where it needs to be. And it has to be there if we have any chance of making sure that the 1,763 aircraft that the Air Force plans to buy are going to be operational or that you have any percentage of those aircraft that will be combat ready which I would argue in the years to come is going to be one of the most important things we need to deter China. Yes, sir. Now, part of this whole equation is supposed to come from a new generation of uninhabited aerial vehicles or drones, as they're more colloquially called. But the new name is Collaborative Combat Aircraft, or CCAs for short. Um, and Mitchell Institute's a big believer in these capabilities, but we're also pragmatic and recognize that this technology is new and ambitious. A crawl, walk, run approach may be prudent to ensure we give these systems a time to mature so we don't conflate what we want to have happen versus what reality dictates. Now, as a member of Congress with oversight responsibilities, what are your thoughts on how we should smartly pursue these new systems, and what kind of factors are you going to be watching as CCAs evolve? Listen, I think the CCAs hold a tremendous amount of promise. Combat aircraft are going to be in the, an integral part of how we pursue tactical air operations in the future. But listen, I think there's still a long road ahead. We still can't get our fourth and fifth generation manned fighter aircraft to reliably share tactically relevant data during combat operations. There's still some hiccups there. I've been out to Nellis and watched the red flag exercises, and these are great aircraft, but there's still challenges there. There's still challenges, too, as we operate these aircraft in all the different realms, as the Navy operates these aircraft, as we look at the efforts going forward with the coordination of getting 
tactically relevant data in real time to other platforms. So CCAs, I think, can hold a tremendous amount of promise. We also not only have to figure out how do we get them to operate in this integrated realm of other manned aircraft, but we also have to be able to determine these aircraft hold a role if we are in a conflict where our communications go down. How do we make sure these aircraft can, again, operate organically, because we're going to need them to operate in that realm if we have significant shutdown of our communications and our links to to all of our, our different aircraft. Listen, I think that I think they're an incredibly important part of that. And we're watching NGAD very closely, both the manned and unmanned components. The overall price of NGAD, especially for the manned component, pretty staggering. So the question is, how do we make sure that it's something that is not only tactically relevant, but also is affordable? So it it can be the best technology in the world, but if it's not affordable, if we can't afford to build the proper number to have a significant impact, then we're not going to be where we need to be. So we're watching very closely the cost and then how the integration of these platforms happens going forward. Thanks very much. Let me just add a quick rejoinder. I'd also add that CA won't recoup the loss of a thousand Air Force aircraft in the next five years. That's correct. If, if the yeah. Air Force, here's an option. If the Air Force increased the F-35 buy from 48 a year to 80 per year, starting in 25, and then retain the 33 F-22s it plans to terminate, that would result in 193 more fighters than they currently have programmed over the next five years. And that's about two wings that would make a difference in the China fight um, if it comes to pass. And it may be a more prudent path than the one the Air Force is on now. But then the Air Force leadership has to ask for the increased resources to do that. Okay, Slick, over to you. That's right. I do want to go back to the UAV discussion quickly. We've talked about it quite a bit on the Aerospace Advantage, but for those that aren't up to speed, and since we have a policy maker, we get to ask you the hard question, sir. But the U.S. imposes some pretty onerous standards that really limit our ability to export these sorts of aircraft, talking about UAVs and CCAs, right? Really, thanks to Cold War era, it's the missile technology control regime. We treat UAVs if they were nuclear-tipped cruise missiles when it comes to potential allied sales. The bar for export is just so high, which means... We are surrendering a huge portion of the international UAV market to global competitors, especially China. In fact, the U.S. AUS Prime effectively just offshored their effort to get around this ridiculous self-imposed constraint that no adversary nation is following. And it's going to be especially problematic as we move to a world where CCAs are a part of this force mix that we were talking about. Jurisdiction over this has split between the armed services and the foreign affairs committees, which really has made huge reforms in this realm challenging. Any advice from your perspective on how we might look to work forward on this issue? I think you're spot on. I spoke recently with the new U.S. ambassador from Australia, former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, and he was pretty forthright. He said, Rob, here's the deal. He said, we now have this AUKUS agreement. And he said, you're treating Australia like a stepchild under Pillar 2, which is really going to push technology transfer in places like unmanned. He said, you treat Canada better than you treat us. He said, Canada can purchase things from you that we can't purchase. You treat Great Britain better than you do us. We're supposed to be your partner in all this. We're supposed to be now be building nuclear submarines, which is indication of the highest level of trust, yet you will not, under ITAR, transfer technology to us. Why? And I told him, I said, Kevin, you're right. We We have to be doing better. We have to make sure, too, that we look at these systems which are too deeply entrenched in bureaucracy. This is all about checking the box instead of looking at, again, acting at the speed of relevance. How do we get the necessary technology in the right hands? And just as you spoke about, our adversaries are doing that. Why wouldn't we want to do that? And we are overly cautious in believing somehow, gosh, if we share this technology that our friends and allies are going to allow it to be captured by the Chinese. The bottom line is the Chinese are already working at stealing this information. In many instances, the technology that they're put, putting out there, that they're selling to our friends, is equal to ours. What are we trying to save and protect? Why wouldn't we want to get out there and do that? Why wouldn't we want to push the issue? All of this stuff just makes no sense to me. It's all wrapped up in the elements of bureaucracy. This is not about outcomes. It's about checking the box. People in the Pentagon go to work each day. And listen, there are a lot of great people in the Pentagon, but a lot of them go there 
as box checkers. I'm going to check my box today. I get my paycheck on Friday. And there's not a problem. Instead of looking at it and going, how can we think creatively and imaginatively to solve the problems that we face today? They have got to act at the speed of relevance. It's not happening. It will be to the detriment of this nation strategically if we don't get together. We cannot by ourselves do the things necessary to counter the Chinese threat. We have countries like Australia that want to be with us and help us, and we have the opportunity to bring others to our side like India. Why are we doing that? We need to be doing that, period. Just as a segue, to the, it's a good segue to this next question, and that's it. We've gone through multiple presidential election cycles now where defense really didn't register at all on either side of the aisle. But those elections happened before Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, do you think that, combined with China's increased aggression, has helped change our nation's perception about defense? Or is it going to, unfortunately, take our losing the next conflict to get the nation's <laughs> attention as to why we have a government in the first place, and that's to provide for the common defense? I think in some ways it has gotten the American people's attention. I think the unprovoked attack by Vladimir Putin on Ukraine is a concern to everyone, as well as China's increased aggression, things like the spy balloon flying over the United States, the other efforts that they're undertaking in the Indo-Pacific, and essentially them saying, hey, if, if Taiwan doesn't by itself allow to be reunified with China, then we will take action in 2027. So I think folks are seeing we live in a much more dangerous world. Listen, there are some elements of what's happening in Ukraine that are being informed by the current economic situation that we face in the United States. And we've seen this happen before. The idea that, you know, that we're sending billions of dollars to Ukraine, yet we have these economic challenges here. I think people sometimes look inwardly and go, hey, let's take care of the issues here first, and then we can help these other nations. I think, too, they don't want this to be a blank check being written to continue to send arms and effort and efforts of help to Ukraine. They want to understand what's the end strategy here. I think they've been frustrated in the previous past where there hasn't been really a definitive strategy about what we are trying to achieve and some of these conflicts that we have been in for decades and then leave without any sort of end result that's been positive for the United States and Vietnam and Afghanistan are the two, two, two most recent examples. So I, I think people understand it. I think they want the United States to be thoughtful. I think, too, they want us to be strong so that we can deter conflict. I think especially with China, I think they understand the challenge with China and they they do want us to deter that conflict. I think, too, the American people don't understand deeply enough the, the strategic imbalance that now is between the United States and China. I think the American people think, naively so, that the American military can do everything and anything. And listen, we still have the best military in the world, but they still need the resources to be able to combat the Chinese and to deter the Chinese. And I would argue we are at a point where that may not be able to occur based on the capability and capacity that we have. So I think we need to do a better job of explaining to the American people where the disparity is between the United States and China and the things we need to do to close that gap. And I want to make sure, too, that they understand that the best way for us to deter a conflict is to have a strong military, the idea of peace through strength. If you are weak, that is provocative. And China, being as aggressive and belligerent as they are, will take advantage of strategic weakness. And, sir, this is something I know you get. And, again, it's heartening to hear a congressman using 3-1 brevity com talking about being Winchester when our magazines are low. But the events in Ukraine have really highlighted the importance of investing in munition stocks. And we've grown just way too used to these accounts being bill payer, which we've seen these inventories run dangerously low. And it's not a new problem. It's something we nearly ran out of munitions fighting in places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, and Syria. And it's a far cry from the demands of a peer fight. So are there steps, in your opinion, that the DOD and Congress can take to help address this chronic problem? We have to. And we're going to be doing some things in this year's Indy to address magazine depth to make sure we rebuild that, but also to make sure we modernize. We have some weapons magazines that are full of old weapons, not just old in, the, in relation to when they're built, but old technology-wise. These are circa 1960s weapons, things like Stinger, which is, listen, it's a great platform, but there are many others out there that have greater range and greater lethality. Another thing we have to do, too, is we have not modernized energetics. 
and energetics are essentially the propellants in the explosives in our weapon systems. Our adversaries have. We use a technology circa 1940s. Our adversaries use as a baseline, a compound developed here in the United States. They use CL-20 as a baseline, which stands for China Lake. We need an all-hands-on-deck call to make sure we modernize energetics. We'll have provisions in this year's NDA that will look to modernize some existing weapons platforms with modernized energetics. So they go farther, greater range, and greater lethality. We need to create an office of energetics so we can modernize our existing platforms, and then we need to get on track to modernize with new energetics existing platforms because we're getting outsticked by the Chinese. And the only way that we're able to catch up is to take existing weapons platforms and use new energetics in them, which gives them greater range and greater lethality. Hey, Mr. Congressman, we're getting pretty tight on time, but I've got one sure. last question for you. If sure. there was one issue that you wish Air Force leaders would bring to the Hill but aren't at present, what would it be? Yeah, listen, I think I've had a number of great discussions with leaders in the Air Force. Recently had breakfast with General C.Q. Brown, and it was great that we got into the details about what's needed going forward. The one thing that I think the Air Force needs to portray each and every day is a deep sense of urgency and a deep sense of coming into Congress and saying, these are the things we need. And I understand that they are restrained by the Office of Secretary of Defense and by the administration. But I want to make sure, too, that when they're asked the question this way, which under the law they are required to ask, answer candidly and with their full focus, and that is when they get asked a question, in your professional military judgment, what are the things that the Air Force needs to do? then they need to be very frank and forthright with Congress and not worry about that's not the position of the administration or the position of the Secretary of Defense, because in order for Congress to do the things that it needs to do, it needs to hear that candid assessment from the Air Force about where they are today. And listen, we can't close this gap in a single year, but there are things that we can do to help enable the Air Force to do more. And we want to make sure we get that candid view from the Air Force. I think that's the biggest thing that they can provide to us, and that will be a help to inform Congress on the things that need to be done. We see a lot of the things that we believe need to be done, and this year we're going to be doing some things pretty aggressively within the National Defense Authorization Act. We, there will be some uh, some growth in the number from last year, probably not enough to do all the things that we would like to do. It'll be a long road between now and what we finally end up with NDAA. But getting that, that candid assessment from the Air, Air Force that is informed by the strategy, not something that is budget constrained, is really what Congress needs to hear and understand. Thanks very much, Mr. Congressman. Um, we really can't thank you enough for your time today. Unfortunately, we're out of it. But this has been a great conversation, and we here at Mitchell Institute wish you all the best as you work to keep America the strongest nation in the world, and we really hope to have you back sometime soon. We would love to be back. Thanks for all the great work that goes on at the Mitchell Institute. We watch and read the things that you all put out very intently, and we appreciate your efforts in driving the discussion forward. So we look forward to coming back with you again soon. And, sir, this is Slick. Just wanted to say thanks as well and look forward to hosting you next time. Sounds great, Slick. Thanks so much. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.